Uh, Phil, uh, Julie, uh, very interesting person. What, what an interesting life, uh, teaching yoga to the stars. Well, yeah, but and she does a whole lot more than that. I know that's what uh, gets attention, the you know the Hollywood connection. But she had she was quite an accomplished actress in her younger years and made a segue into the world of yoga and yoga therapy and um, is quite well known around LA and doing a very good job of bringing yoga to people and helping uh, in training teachers as well. Yeah, I, she studied with Meisner at the Neighborhood Playhouse and I think uh, Meisner was all about uh, being a real person in a, in a, in a fictitious, uh, in a fictional setting or scene and how you, to do that you have to be right in the moment and uh, uh, I mean, I think that uh, she was describing as the way uh, you, you, she uses yoga to allow that to happen. And uh, I, I think it's great. And, and what's interesting, and you touched upon it in the interview uh, about these yogic traditions and how they're being used now. And I thought that maybe uh, it was, uh, you know, somebody working in that arena with actors <clears throat> might, you know, use yoga in a way that somebody might use use it as aerobics or just a form of exercise without really looking at it fully as what it is. Uh, but it sounds like she really uh, is plugged into the tradition or traditions of yoga and is very serious about uh, utilizing yoga in the best possible way. Yeah, and um, but your, your uh, question is a good one and your concern because I'm sure there are plenty of people teaching just asanas and just yoga as a fitness uh, regimen or flexibility regimen. And, you know, sort of when you hear people talking about how yoga is being practiced by uh, athletes, for example, well, most of them are just using them uh, to stretch and uh, get their body into gear for, for their work and so forth. And, and there's not much attention being paid to the, you know, the, the totality of what yoga is and the deeper meaning of what yoga is. And that's a, that's a big concern all around in the yoga community and among, uh, you know, serious uh, spiritual practitioners and uh, the Hindu community that yoga is, you know, in danger of becoming synonymous with physical fitness. And uh, there's a certain... Uh, deterioration of, of, of the possibilities of what yoga really means and can be for people. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating to me because I, so many of the advertisements I see for yoga uh, are no different than the ads I'd see for a, you know, a twirling class or a, uh, a Zumba dancing class where, hey, get in shape, learn to stretch, whatever. And, and not that there's anything wrong with that, not that it's not effective in doing that, but I would think that some of the great yoga uh, masters of the past would be rolling, uh, turning in their graves, uh, knowing that yoga was uh, being used in that way, and maybe that way alone in some cases. Uh, right, doing headstands in their grave. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, it's true, but, you know, and, and, and there's a very good reason to be concerned. There's a lot of people saying, look, if you just want to teach asanas and the physical practice, Please do so, and you know, but don't ignore the fact that there's more to it, and let people know there's more to it. Or don't call yourself a yoga teacher; call yourself a teacher of asana or something like that. Um, it, because you know, it, the big picture in this is is a, a serious one, where we are adapting teachings from a culture that's very old and a country that's very different and a spiritual tradition very different from our own. And like any other sort of imported product, uh, people are always going to adapt it to their culture and their interests and their concerns. And that, that goes on all the time. It, you know, whether it's a, a, a fashion or an art form or a food or whatever. But here you're dealing with a very deep and old and sacred tradition. And so there has to be some uh, integrity when you adapt it that you don't corrupt it and you don't uh, dilute 
its its effectiveness and its power. So finding the balance is uh, not an easy issue, and it, you know, and it, it can be a very emotional one for people. Right, I, I, I can imagine. Uh, the other thing I, I, I wanted to touch upon uh, in terms of a talk that I found very interesting, uh, like uh, John Pentergast, I think it was, who we had on uh, a couple of months ago, uh, she uses yoga as part of psychotherapy. I, I think that's yes. fantastic because there's definitely a, a physical component to our mental health, and uh, yoga is uh, obviously a, a wonderful tool if utilized properly uh, for yeah. a therapist. And, and yeah, and we should cross-reference some of our interviews. The one we did, as you said, with John Prendergast, uh, who is a, a psychotherapist uh, with a strong background in meditation and non-dual philosophy. Um, a different kind of take than Julie's, who, who teaches Hatha Yoga and, uh, um, you know, with an emphasis on asana and pranayama and all that. So there are two different ways of integrating the you know, sort of Eastern and Western sciences, and there there are many others as well. It's a fascinating right. development. Right. And, and Phil, could you imagine uh, if when we were 25 years old, uh, a therapist would have suggested to somebody they do yoga or meditation? It was absolutely unheard of. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. At that time, things have changed. Well, when we were twenty-five-ish, that's when it started to change. Right. You know, that's when uh, you know, in, in the heyday of TM back in the in the mid seventies, after all the research came out, uh, you know, there were psychotherapists already beginning to introduce meditation into into psychotherapeutic contexts. Right. Do, do, do and, you remember? Do you remember Doctor uh, Gluck from the Heart yes. Institute? Yeah. He was one of the first. He was a highly regarded uh, a psychiatrist, and right. he was one of the first to really show a deep interest in meditation and how it might be used, uh, specifically TM, uh, back in the day. And then our mutual friend Harold Bloomfield, you know, talked about it on the Merv Griffin show, and uh, you know, from a psychotherapeutic perspective. I mean, when I give talks sometimes and I tell the history. When I get when I talk about uh, Maharishi and the TM movement, I, I say in a few short years from the time the Beatles went to India, uh, meditation in general and TM in particular moved from this youth counterculture thing, and and all the news stories were about how you know youth young people are getting off of uh, LSD and meditating to expand their consciousness. And then a few years later, the the same you know the the media was talking about how grown ups were getting off of Valium and meditating to you know get over their anxiety and their depression. Uh, so the the emphasis sort of shifts uh, at different times for different populations, but it ta it it speaks to the versatility of these practices. Absolutely, and, and uh, I think in the the coming months. Uh, we'll have more uh, on our show uh, from the world of yoga, obviously, as we discuss uh, uh, everything and anything uh, concerned with contemporary uh, spirituality. Uh, you're listening to Dennis Ramundi and my co-host Phil Goldberg, again, author of uh, American Veda. Uh, our website, spiritmatterstalk.com, our show, Spirit Matters. It, it, that, it's a great name, Phil. You came up with it, Spirit Matters, because I think everything uh, comes under the umbrella of spirit and matter. Yeah, and uh, and it matters. <laughs> all right. And we, discuss, and we discuss all the matters uh, involved. But I want to encourage people to uh, go to the website when it's up and subscribe to it. And the subscription is free, but it means we, we can update you on what's going on and who's coming up and other items of interest. Great. www.spiritmatterstalk.com. Until next time, Phil, thanks a lot. Okay, Dennis. Have next a good one. time. Right. Bye.